Uh, my name is Donna Murphy. I'm a co-leader of the Braver Angels Film Club. Uh, the other co-leaders of the club who are here with us tonight are Ivan Kaysan and Marvi, Molly Zeth and Ron McFarland. So uh, welcome to all of you. And tonight we'll be discussing the film Join or Die, which is about Robert Putnam and his uh, premise uh, about the importance of joining clubs, organizations, religious communities, that it's so important for your mental and physical health and actually for the health of civil society. And if you didn't get a chance to see that uh, movie, we, we, it was, uh, we, did, we did this in um, conjunction with our partner uh, um, in, in Florida, uh, the, um, who, uh, the village. Uh, uh, the, uh, what, um, it's uh, the village square. And so the village square uh, actually did a webinar with Robert Putnam uh, and uh, uh, as part of that, they made available the free showing of the movie Join or Die, but only through October 5th. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to watch the movie, if you have read his book, uh, Bowling Alone, or his subsequent book, The Upswing, or just are kind of about the importance of joining organizations, uh, you'll no problem, you'll certainly be able to, to join us in uh, participating in the discussion tonight. Um, and actually, so, Donna, ahead. can I can I add something to that on a related note? Sure, go ahead. Um, if for anybody who didn't get to see the film, just since this is an unusual one where like you had to have access to it only for a certain amount of time, don't like feel shy at all about throwing out any questions you have for clarification during the discussion. It would, there's probably someone else who didn't get to see it. And also I just wanted to mention overall one sentence like high level thesis, which I don't know if it was in Bowling Alone, having not read Bowling Alone, was basically that joining more groups in a democracy exposes you to more types of people, build stronger connections, and actually makes democracy stronger. That's like a very bird's eye view summary. So. Okay, thank you, Molly. Um, so let's start with a few Braver Angels ground rules. We're here to understand others and to explore our views, not to convince anyone to change their mind. We'll take turns, not interrupt others, and listen to everyone, and open up space for quieter group members be respectful. In other words, we bring our best selves to this discussion. And then during the discussion, if you'd like to speak, please raise your electronic hand, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. And with that, uh, with the webinar that the Village Square did, uh, what the reason we decided to do a, this uh, event after that is we're going to, this is a standard Brave Angels film discussion, which means that everybody can talk. Um, during the event as opposed to the webinar, which was uh, just a, a handful of people talking um, to each other. So now you all get a chance to, to share your opinions and views. Um, and the way we do that is by asking you questions. Um, so with that, let's start off with Molly, who's going to ask the first question. Great, and as I like to do often, I will put this in the chat as well. So if you miss it or if you need a reminder of what it is later, you'll see it there as well. So the first question, we always start with something kind of generic and higher level. So I'm going to say this one. For those of you who saw Joiner die, basically we want to know what you thought of it, just general opinions on it. And did you find its premise compelling, the idea that joining groups is key to our physical health, happiness, um, halting America's unraveling. Like, did you find the premise compelling? So feel free to respond to the general overview question, just what you what you thought about it. That leads to often other parts of the discussion, or to the second part that I'm going to put in the chat as well. And oh, and um, if you didn't catch it, the raise hand feature is in the bottom middle of the screen. And I'll give people a chance to think for a moment. Okay, and John Leonard has his hand raised. Great. John, go for it. I thought she said John Lennon and I got excited because I really like the beat. <laughs> but John, I'm sure you're great too. <laughs> you know, the only for, reason that, that I miss John Lennon is since I was 10, 12 years old is that I don't get that so much anymore since he's gone <laughs> from the time I was a kid. <laughs> anyway, I thought I thought it was a great uh, film. I, I did not. I knew about the book, and I actually 
constantly talk about the book when I'm in volunteer groups because all groups have, have experienced the decline that Putnam documents in bowling alone. And so it was great to hear all the background that came from the film. It was great to hear the discussion by the, the village, by village square two weeks ago. And I, I actually gave the book. We had our, our associate pastor, you know, uh, Donna, you mentioned you're a firebrand Unitarian, you know, always discussing things. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian here in North in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And we're, we're always discussing things too, but our, our uh, associate pastor, she left uh, and went to another church, and I gave her that book because we were talking about growing church membership and all of that, and I thought it was interesting because in, in, in all the different groups, I am a member of a number of professional and church and, and uh, other uh, organiz volunteer organization groups, and everybody has the same issue is how do we attract more members and our our membership is getting old and we're the same old people that do everything. And, and I, I'll use the crude term. I'm a Coast Guard guy. And when I was a Coast Guard member of the New Orleans Rugby Club a long time ago, when my, our, uh, they benefited from Coast Guard people rotating through New Orleans every few years. And one of my Coast Guard buddies said, yeah, we're the, the SFGs who do everything in, in, a, in a club. The S same guys who do everything. <laughs> Same <laughs> F guys who do everything, and and so uh, and it, it's true, and you'll see that in, in just about every club or organization you you're in, and and it, I I think that that Putnam's thesis in the book was was really correct in terms of targeting it, and I'm really glad to see this new uh, book come out and the and the you know the going back now 20 years and and relooking at that whole. Uh, body of research that, that he developed, and, and I really, really enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah, that's something that didn't come up in the movie, I don't think, that it's the same core people often doing the, the work, the organizing. Well, yeah, that's my, that's, like I said, that's my my thing from my Coast Guard buddy, because that's something else when I when I talk to people in, in clubs that I'm in and groups that I'm in. Is, okay, so is that know. that will come up no, after how do we attract more members? They look around and say, yeah, it's always the same people that make everything happen. You know, that, that 10% or 2% of people that make everything happen. Maybe. Well, thank you. Know. Does anyone else want to add to that or have another separate thought about the film? All right, well, we are a small group tonight, so that means we get to just jump into the next question, which is coming from Ron. And I'm going to put this into the chat as well. Go for it, Ron. <laughs> Hello, everyone, tonight. <laughs> Sound like we got some background, but that's okay. Yeah, um, the question is what are, your thoughts, what are your thoughts on the decline in civil participation, including religion? as presented by Putnam. How might this trend evolve in the future? Uh, so what are your thoughts on the decline in civil participation? Don't run all at once now. <laughs> I know you got some thoughts out there. So is everyone in, in this group part of a group? Uh, do they participate in the civil? Uh, and maybe that might be a reason why if you're only in maybe one or two or none. Oh, Keith, unmute yourself. Go ahead. Sure, I'll give this a try. So, All right. um, you know, I, I, I do think it is not only a matter of of trust in in anything that is organized, um, and you know we we've seen that decline of trust in in organizations and organized um, religion over the last you know twenty thirty years. So, I mean it's been very well documented, um, and it's almost to the point I think that um, that not only civic engagement, but also um, community engagement has has morphed into a value-add proposition. 
um, you know, most folks generally want to know what's in it for me and then what is it going to cost me? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why, um, to, to John's point, you have the same old people doing, you know, doing, doing the things, um, you know, I, I think, I think a, a good example of that, excuse me, uh, a good example of that in, in action, just to sort of use as a parallel is, um, the massive reorganization in the college football, uh, power five, mm -hmm. right. Uh, a, as a friend of mine. One, uh, tells me often, the answer is money. Now, what's your question? Um, and, and so, if you if you pull from that, if you pull from that uh, from that sort of premise, um, that you know, it's really, it's unfortunately not so much about connection and community more than it is a value add proposition. Um, I, I think that helps to kind of shed light on on you know, that decline in in religious organizations and just organized organizations overall. Hmm. That's a great that's a great perspective, especially when you started off with trust. Yeah, that is that is uh you know, that's interesting. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, okay. Especially in today's society. And and then you brought up one of my passions, bar football, because I play a lot of fantasy football. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, Keith. Donna. Well, I, I did want to add, I just read something today. They did a study that the number of people since COVID, now that COVID's over, the number of people attending theaters, social, uh, classical music, concerts, other concerts, going to movie theaters, that has all declined. Uh, and uh, all these uh, 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 so uh, opportunities for people to get together to go out and do something, in addition to opportunities to getting together to uh, in these clubs and organizations and such. And uh, it seems to have, uh, at least according to Putnam, have started with television in particular when 1950s, 1960s TV came to the fore. And now with the internet, it's it's incredibly distracting to be able to just hop onto the internet or uh, on TV, you know, go stream a television uh, show or a movie, all these other choices. And I think, you know, uh, one thing Keith is getting at in terms of the, um, you know, finding the value in it, we don't really understand the value in terms of these organizations connecting each other, how important it is to uh, the civic society, our own health, uh, until it's too late, we it, it, we somehow need to get the word out better or or show people how much better off they are when they are actually participating. They're out there physically um, with each other as opposed to just being online or in front of the boob tube. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. That is an interesting way you went with our physical health, our health. Yeah, because I don't think maybe back in the 50s, they probably even thought about that. They just got in a group and just thought that was what they supposed to do. So thank you. Thank you for that. Craig, how you doing, Diamond? Craig Diamond? <laughs> how are you? Super. I'm doing super. So, um, uh, Don, I'm glad you mentioned TV. So I, I didn't read Bowling Alone and I didn't see the documentary, but I did read The Upswing. Okay. And I was trying to, when I saw the question about what are my thoughts about the decline in civic participation, including religion, I was trying to rack my brain about around what did Putnam talk about as the causes? We talked about, in the upswing anyway, you know, a lot of amazing data that all sort of painted the same picture that led to the one big upside down uh, U they talked about in the upswing. But I couldn't think of what are the causes he talked about. And I think certainly one's got to think that television and, and technology, communication technology has been a part of it. I also just wonder how much of it has to do with the steady progression away from, you know, uh, our agrarian roots, you know, where um, you were just part of your 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 family with multi-generations that you were in a community where you 
consumed products that were made in your community that you contributed to that. And, you know, I'm just wondering with the industrial revolution and people going to cities and then with airplanes and the ability to just move around to jobs, I'm just wondering how much of that has also contributed to, to a, you know, lessening of cohesion. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just, just kind of the thought that I had. Hey, thank you, Craig. You know, it slips my mind some of the causes. I know when they spoke about how it uh, affected the black community because uh, when segregated segregation ended, it seemed to be a reverse. Uh, they were open to go wherever they, you know, as participating in the community and it affected them because a lot of times they were a cohesive group in the community and everything was at the church and everything was together. The, the businesses were all black owned and then, and then and it seems like when that uh, was uplifted uh, for a positive, but then it became kind of a negative. So as far as that, he, he did point that out, I remember. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. David, how are you doing? I'll mute yourself, David. And we'll we'll wait for you. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah, there you go. Not, there you go. Not That's so go. technologically yeah. fast here. But anyway, right. um, kind of piggybacking on what Craig was saying, I I didn't see the movie, um, but I did did read Bowling Alone. And I remember there were a number of causes and a, a big one was generation change. Mm -hmm. But I remember reading his discussion and it seemed it seemed unclear. It's like, why did the generations change? Or, mm -hmm. and, and he said something about that at the seminar a couple of weeks ago, too. And I don't know how he's dealt, you know, sort of re-looked at that in upswing. But you know, so that was a strong cause that that was out there, but that it was it was hard to know what to make of it exactly. And then I'll mention there's one other thing that stuck with me from Bowling Alone that he talked about, where, where he referred to another sociological study that came before his book by about 15 years or so. Um, some researchers who looked at the growth of like shopping centers mm -hmm. and malls, like especially into the mid 60s and how it kind of fed this sort of way of looking at your destinations as you know no longer going down to the 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 main street in town and seeing everyone you know and stuff but you know you define your goals boy i need to go to this shop and you get in your car and you go to the mall and then you go somewhere else and that these researchers talked about how it broke down the sense of a bounded community in a way. Um, so, yeah, just recalling that. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Now, I saw Molly saying, oh, there you go, Molly. All right, um, there you go. I just wanted David to go first. Um, yeah. I was just going to chime in and say, with the decline of congregational membership, I feel like, I'm not an expert on this at all, just my sense is anecdotally that nothing has replaced that as like a jumping off to other forms of engagement with society. And so I think that's part of the issue too, is like when, pe I mean, not that people need to go out and just start believing in God, and that's not the solution. Um, you can't make people have faith, but there's, I mean, yes, there are atheist communities or there are humanistic communities, but it doesn't feel like en masse anything has replaced that as a core. I know like um, just I'll share two little anecdotes like historically I know the black church was heavily involved in the civil rights movement for instance and I know in my own community I see um, uh, I mean multiple Jewish communities and every one of them is you know to some extent politically active 
And so having that tie of like the civic participation with the religious piece has always been a part of like for years, at least has been a part of my life. Then it also adds social events. And then on top of that, you have um, uh, a, a sort of intellectual events, you know, so like people, people just like end up combining everything like with one community. And I don't see like a, an easy way to replicate that in a non faith based context. So just we'll put it out there as like a, an unsolvable, well, I mean, a solvable, but I'm not sure how, problem. So. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Molly. Ah, Jan, is it Jana? Or, all right, unmute yourself. You have a nice smile, Jana. Hi. Um, right. So just kind of uh, a little bit more about what Molly was saying. As I, I, Also what I think Keith was saying about, so I'm from a college town, and I, I go to a lot of the seminars in the religious studies um, department. And the professor that was talking most recently said that the college kids don't want to join a church, even though they, they know that they're lacking community, their whole life is on their social media, and they know they're lacking that and they need it, but they don't want to be identified, to have an identification with, say, a religious group. Um, they call themselves the nuns, like no denomination. And what the university has done is they have taken what I think used to be more of like a, a Christian-based off-campus place for people to go, and they've just made it a coffee house. And it's just called a coffee house, and it's a way for people to go. And if conversations come up in one direction or another, it, it by taking away that um, religious aspect, it, it really has made a difference. So I'm trying to get my church to do something like that, to to have something where there's people can just come and have a cup of coffee and ask questions if they like, you know, so. All right, thank you. Philip, there you go. Can y'all you hear me yeah. all right? Yeah, sure, loud and clear. Okay, uh, Jenna, I just wanted to say, when you said that, I kind of perked up because I actually, I, I grew up in a non-religious household, but I joined a church when I was doing my undergraduate, um, particularly because I didn't have a lot of friends, and I was trying to find other people to meet, and there were not nearly as many organizations uh, in my area um, that I thought I could join and the the church was very open to young people it was I think it was a ministry that was kind of intended for college students um and I didn't end up staying with that ministry for very long but I did end up getting a lot of social opportunities through that um and and I agree I think that the the idea that folks would like to be secularized and be outside of that um, without there being an actual replacement for the social setting of the church is a big part of the challenge that uh, the book and the the book recognized. I didn't watch the movie, but the book recognized. Okay. Thank you for your perspective there. And Molly, and then we'll move to the next yeah. question. I just yeah. wanted to respond to, was it Jana or John? Is it Jana? Is that a, okay, sorry. Uh, Jana's comment. Mm -hmm. I worked yeah. in, um, this is just a fun historical context for coffee shops and political activism. I worked in the um, fair trade coffee, chocolate, and, and tea industry for years at a company called, a cooperative called Equal Exchange. And in studying the history of coffee, we learned that coffee shops were actually a, a source of fear for governments when they were invented centuries ago, because people <laughs> at a tavern would be drunk and it's harder to be politically active when you're drunk. But if you're at a coffee shop and you're you know highly caffeinated and totally sober, it's easier to start revolutions. <laughs> And so um, when we were actually training a cafe to start in Saudi Arabia, that was politically active. Um, during our, our my coworkers training of that cafe, no surprise, the Saudi Arabian government actually shut them down because they were trying to be this third space that would also just happen to do some political you know, work on the side. So. Yeah, um, thank you, Molly. I just, just for reference, before I go to David and then we'll go to the next question. Uh, it says here 66% decline in unions, 50% decline in the clubs, 35% decline since the 60s in religious groups, 50% decline in leadership role type things. And it goes on and on, get different categories. So actually there's a bigger decline in a lot of other groups, but, uh, but more so than it seems in religion. I know we tend to focus on that, but 
just to point that out, that it's it's a decline in every group. So anyway, David, you'll be the last one, and then I'll read the next question, okay? Go ahead, David. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking, particularly when Jana was speaking about a book I read not too long ago by this um, sociologist of religion, his name is Wade Clark Roof, I think, and his thing, and he wrote this 25 years ago, but he what he was looking at in religious communities was a change toward what he calls people being seekers. It's like moving away from just being happy with sort of the expected rituals and the institutional forms. And even, you know, theology and the ideas, it's, but it, I mean, he was feeling that like a whole lot of people in this country are really on a quest for personal meaning. And one of the things that comes from that is that it makes people more fluid in their associations. Because if it's so, then so many people are just trying to piece things together for themselves. So like earlier, Keith was talking about, um, you know, the answer is money, you know, and that whole thing. And you see that. But on the other hand, and maybe somehow they go together, I don't know how, there may be a way that people avoid really firm, firm uh, group connections because we're so much trying to work things out for ourselves right now at some deep level. You know? Yeah, that goes back to a particular other, uh, we, when we opened up, uh, they were saying, I think it was Keith who said, it's all about me. What do I get out of it? And that narrative, what you just said, tends to uh, see uh, sense that. But then I hesitate. You know, I can't put that across the board for every, you know, say uh, a person belonging to a being a Buddhist, Muslim, atheist. I mean, an atheist. Not, uh, you know, I would ask my friends, "Is that a religion?" I always mess with me about that one. We have nice conversations. So anyway, the next question. Ah, what are your thoughts on the decline? We we no what reflecting on Putnam's teaching. What specific uh, aspects or ideas do you find particularly thought provoking, or something noteworthy that you you find you found from his teachings? Something that was just just said, bing, you know, and and you thought about it, uh, you know, is something thought provoking. Uh, some of you have already said a few things. Uh, I think Keith led off with the, the trusting piece. And how about uh, how about you, John? Go ahead. I what I thought was interesting is I recall the the book and and the interpretations of it and the reviews of it were mm -hmm. the, the way Putnam basically broke. And there were more items. He, he mentioned that that it had in the in the. Uh, documentary, they talked about how the original uh, Bowling Alone was uh, was an editorial in the early 1990s that then really hit, struck a nerve and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were having Putnam to the White House to discuss the, the yeah. drop in social capital and, and uh, societal concern and as Keith said, it's all about me, what's in it for me rather than what's in it for all of us and then they did all this research and came out with the with the book then later on bowling alone around 2000 and as i recall he basically pointed the finger at, at basically three causes and as uh, i think it was david was saying earlier about the the uh, causes uh, of people just not joining but one of them was that there just the multiplicity of clubs and activities that we have now in the early 20th first century versus 100 years ago when when really there the, to Tocqueville said that Americans have always been joiners and creators of association but really a lot of the associations rotary clubs civitan clubs alcoholics anonymous Donna mentioned toastmasters 
They, you know, radio, they all started in the 1920s. And so largely the rise of clubs and organizations, I track with the greatest generation because I revere the greatest generation. I'm a military guy and I, I revere the, the, the guys who grew up and gals who grew up during the depression and then went off and won World War II and essentially built the society that we now inherit and that we're talking about whether or not it's, it's fraying around the edges. And it, and it didn't include everybody, you know, it was largely segregated. You know, there was, there was a, a white community and then there was people of color community. And, and, and that was a, a fault of it, but it was generally uh, something that, that really built modern America. But Putnam said there were three things, the multiplicity of choices, the rise of two career families in the 1970s, which was a good thing for women, obviously, but it, it put a drain on people's time. And then the third thing was people started, as they lived farther and farther out in the suburbs and were commuting, they lived farther away from their workplace. And so they couldn't uh, take the time like to go to a club meeting in the evening because they had to get home to their uh, two career family and they and then, uh, you know, get into kids sports and all that kind of thing. So where there were a number of different things that I thought in Putnam's teaching were were very interesting. And what I see now that uh, and as the, the comment was made by by Philip and, and also by uh, Keith is I see I work for IBM and, and we were virtual before COVID. And so I, th I think one of the things that you're going to see coming is there's a real estate crisis coming where you've got all these big empty office buildings where so many people are working from home now that, that the buildings can't afford to sustain themselves anymore. You know, real estate companies are going to give the keys back to the bank because nobody's working in office buildings. And IBM, we have these, they're regularly having free lunches and all kinds of events to encourage right. people to come into the office like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday because they're trying to get people to, to meet each other in person. And I get annoyed because I'm a project manager and I'll sit in meetings like this and people never turn on their darn camera. <laughs> I'm staring at, at blank screens. Well, and that's like, okay. I, I, I want to be rude and say, would you work wear a burqa to an in-person meeting? Mm. Well, then turn on your camera, please. But yeah. I, you know, I, I bite my military tongue when I when I have that urge. But. Those are the you things sure that did, I, you sure I, didn't I, bite it this time, John. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you for your perspective there. And we'll go with Craig, and then we'll go to the next question. Uh, Craig, go so, for uh, it. I, I apologize if I keep talking about the upswing, since that's the only book that I read. But uh, hopefully that's sort of part of... Uh, okay, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm I read it myself. I read it as well. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, just for those that haven't... I'm just, read it I mean, those on this zoom that haven't read it you know the mention of the it's all about me you know the what putnam basically says in that is that the late late 19th century during the gilded age was all about me and then peaking in like the late 50s perhaps early 60s we were more of a, a we society and since the early 60s or late 50s, we've been drifting more and more down towards where we were in the Gilded Age, where there's a much greater level of selfishness and less social cohesion. So I think that that's what I found so compelling in that book um, was a really strong argument in terms of data that backed up that, that, that concept that really have gone from uh, to I, to we, back to I. Yeah, okay, thank I just, you. Can I say one th more thing about Putnam, or do you want, you want you to go? You can, on? yeah, you can, you can, uh, unless I'm getting no, no, tired. No, go ahead. I, yeah. I feel like yeah, I'm going off the show. Go ahead. You sure? Yeah, yeah. Right, it, is it related to the, the, the question, or is it you just wanted to bring uh, up something? Sort of. You know what, I'm going to skip. Go ahead. Okay, we'll come back to you. All right, thank you. Okay. Now, I'm going to read, uh, Philip, before I call on you, we're going to, I'm going to go on to the next question, and then you can be the first to answer that, Philip. <laughs> okay. 
So the uh, next question is how are our interactions in the digital era, social media, impacting our capacity to cultivate and sustain social capital? And what potential consequences might this hold for the future of our society, our democracy, as Putnam was talking about, okay? That's all a mouthful, but uh, in essence, it's basically saying how uh, how has social media affected us uh, as far as joining groups and things of that nature? So, ah, Keith, go for it. So, okay, so so I, I I'm going to engage in a little bit of double speak because okay. because I am a technologist, but I also see this. Uh, um, in its positive lights, as well as in its very dark underbellies. Um, and so, and so technology, um, you know, the digital divide, social media, so on and so forth, um, has done a number of things, but one of the things that it, that it has done most effectively is it has amplified our cognitive dissidence. And so, um, and so, you know, you don't, generally people don't do technology in community. Um, you know, when, when we, when we game, we generally game on our own, unless you're playing Fortnite or something, you know, something else like that, where it's, where it's, a uh, um, a multiplayer sort of ecosystem. And even that it's still me against the world, literally, um, yeah. um, and as John was uh, was talking about, yes, a lot of meetings nowadays very virtual, um, and folks have their cameras off. I mean, this I mean th this is this is almost an exception um, where you have this many people with their cameras on, but but there's a lot of confirmation bias um, and um, cognitive dissonance that gets amplified because of technology, and it makes it easier to be more siloed. It makes it very easy, um, you know, to um, um, to be freer in thoughts of isolation than it is for a community. Um, and, and, and so, and so as, as much as I, as much as I love technology, I mean, it, it pays my bills and it's, it's made me a, a pretty decent living. Um, I also see that there's an undercurrent um, that largely has gone unchecked. And, and at this stage in the game, um, as a technologist, I am, I am overly doubtful that that genius can be put back in the, in the bottle. And, and we don't have, as a society, as a community, even as, as a set of neighbors, we don't have the, the tool sets and even more importantly, we don't have the language to really speak uh, to really to really speak to that issue um, in a way that counteracts what technology has done very effectively and very uh, um, covertly in in the past and now very overtly now. Um, you know, just in terms of of making it easy, make it easier to silo. Thank, Ron, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Well said. Well said. Uh, Philip, how about you going next? Uh, thank you. Uh, Keith, I, I agree with everything that you said, and I think you said it better than I could have. Um, what I will add is that I am on probably the uh, highest end that a Zoomer can be. I'm 24 years old. I think I'm the cutoff year. Um, so I am the first generation that has grown up entirely in the digital age um, that has grown up 100% with at least cursory access to internet. I was born in 99. Um, all throughout my childhood, we had uh, computers in the house. Um, we had dial up internet early on, but anyways, we, we've had some kind of internet access and some kind of global activity access um, my entire life. And I know that it's affected me on, on a physiological level. I can't even look at something for more than 15 seconds without losing attention. Um, I've spent years trying to 
kind of gain that back. Uh, ADHD is incredibly common in my age, and I don't think it's misdiagnosed. Um, you know, the kind of things that that we complain about, older folks complaining about, um, are very genuine problems. And I think that those problems have also contributed to the antisocial behavior um, that is kind of plaguing our generation. Um, Keith, on, on to what you said, you said that there's an opportunity um, for community on the internet, and I agree. Um, and you mentioned siloing. And I think siloing is becoming significantly worse. And that's part of the reason that an organization like Braver Angels even needs to exist, because siloing through um, the international media of the internet is nothing. It, it's something that our human brains were not meant to comprehend, just on an evolutionary basis. Um, we were meant to be able to comprehend our local communities, our local needs. Um, and maybe some of the immediate threats to our current existence. And um, we were not meant to comprehend the constant barrage of international conflict, the constant barrage of international uh, climate events, the constant barrage of economic instability, and total... I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. This isn't a therapy session. I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... I think that that causes a lot of people to retreat inwards, and um, that's why some cultures like incel culture, I don't know if any of you guys even know what that word means. It's a group of people who think that they're never going to find a relationship, yeah. so they decide they hate right. women. Um, yeah. Other uh, Alt-right, far-right uh, fascist groups have also grown out of the same thing because those are people who say, hey, all these things that scare you um, have one cause, and here's what it is. And those kind of communities are growing at an extreme pace. And mm -hmm. I think that the general community has not been able to properly address the fear that the younger generation feels with everything. <laughs> and uh, and as a result, people are kind of moving away from uh, a lot of other non um, non-essential communities and moving more into communities where they can talk about their individual mental uh, and sociological health problems. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Philip. You did. You touched on some uh, great points uh, that uh, connected with Keith as well. And uh, just keep in mind, you know, we have far left too. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so uh, keep that in mind. It's affecting all groups, it seems like to me. But uh, you know, I just tune it out by just turning off my computer. <laughs> anyway, Craig, how about you? And then we'll go to Ivan after that. I just wanted to quickly have a comment to Philip, and then I had a question for what Keith was talking about before. So, Philip, I don't know if you, like, blog on this stuff or, like, if you talk about this stuff, but I feel like you're very, you have a very important and eloquent voice with this issue and I, you know, I would hope that voices like yours can be heard. Um, you said a lot of things that um, I see in my own 23 year old son, um, things that I find worrisome. Um, so I, 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 I know that what you're saying is not out in left field at all. Anyway, I encourage you to make your voice heard um, in any way you want on this. And then Keith, question for you. Can you elaborate on how we're using the term cognitive dissonance in the context of what you were saying before? I couldn't quite connect what you were meaning. I know what cognitive dissonance is, but how did it relate to what you were talking about? We'll, we'll, give, we'll give Keith 30 seconds. How about that? Let's see if you can do it in 30 seconds. Go so, for it. So, uh, so. So one one of the things, and and I remember this uh, when when it was being developed, um, in the um, in the early two thousands uh, in technology, we we were working on this thing called predictive analytics. So pretty much based on what you search for, based on what you would do in the course of a day, um, technology could predict what it is you were going to do, you know, an hour, two hours, next day, whatever the case is, and beat you to it and pretty much set up everything that you were going to do 
um, uh, in advance. Fast forward a couple of years, now we have um, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so based on, so based on the treasure trove of, of data that, uh, uh, that has been mined over the last 30 some odd years, um, your entire, your entire sort of technology, um, 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 engagement for lack of better words has been curated for you. Mm -hmm. And that curation is going to do one of two things. Either it's going to keep you going further down the bunny hole or two, it's going to put you in a place to where all the things that you have been thinking about before and all the things that you've been saying before, um, it's going to amplify that even more, leading into a further cognitive dissonance to where, to where, to where pretty much technology is helping you see the world that you want to see instead of the world as it actually is. Mm -hmm. So basically you're saying your mind is perception versus reality. So it's, it's playing with your mind. And I generally have a, a rule, don't become the book, don't become the computer. You know what I mean? You gotta really you know, know that put whatever it is in your bag and then maybe use it, but then not. It is, it's, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I totally understand you, Keith. And uh, yeah. thanks for that, yeah. that question, Craig. So we'll turn it over to Ivan. Go for it. Thanks, Ron. Um, yeah. I want to switch things a little bit and look at generations, not in society, but generations that you've been through. In other words, your life stages. Um, over the years, have you experienced a loss of connection to other people? And if so, in what way, in what stage of life were you in? And I can tell you that my own story is that my the apex of my social connection was in college because I lived in a dorm. And there were all these people who were similarly situated, um, similar age, similar interests, but people from all over the country. And that was kind of the high point. As I started the work life, um, that circle got smaller, but still pretty large. Still a lot of people that were similarly situated, but as people got into relationships, they got into families, the family people broke off and did their own thing. Um, I was, I have been uh, single. And so I lost a lot of friends due to them moving into their family circles. So I was wondering in terms of um, people in this meeting, have you seen that kind of phenomenon in your life where your stage of life kind of shapes how, how big is your social circle? What options you have? Philip. If someone else wants a chance to talk, I just spoke. But, um, no, you're the first one up. Okay. Um, I went to, wow, I'm sorry. My dogs are so loud. Uh, yeah, if someone else wants to go, I'm going to shut my door. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, anybody else want to jump in? I'll say something about what I've been putting in the chat about meetings of opposites. I think that the cause of our, our malaise and the, the decline of, of sociality is that we live in a media that that makes it impossible. It's kind of a philosophical media um, and a social media, um, a technological media. Um, but Martin Buber is the one that distinguishes um, the kind of media that we're in. He calls it I, it speaking speaking as if everybody else was a, was a, was a thing, um, was located in a grid of concepts. So I'm, I'm going off in the philosophical tangent here, um, and I'm going to stop very soon. But the, uh, the difference of, of, of difference of that um, from what he calls IU speaking, which is when uh, a people, a, a person meets another person um, with whom there is some um, special um, connection. We don't get that 
you can't get that on Facebook. You can't get that even um, even if you could make eye contact um, on a screen. Um, and um, so we are so um, we are we are so desperately lacking in 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 the kinds of environments in which that's in which that's that kind of relating is is allowed and enabled. Okay. That's it. Now, if I if I understand you, Henry, you're still talking about a societal type of condition, right? I'm talking about um, ways people can be together. Yeah, there are, the society makes ways of being together, and society's way of being together um, is is increasingly um, destructive hmm. of the kind of relationship that we need. Okay, my, I think my question was more about what stage of life type of issue might be shaping your social connection. Uh, Philip, are you still, are you able to join in now? Sorry, I, I didn't give, answer the question. I can give it a try. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I went to university in Fort Lauderdale. I had a scholarship down there. Um, and I am from a farm in central Illinois. I'm actually currently on the farm helping my family due to some family issues, but um, it is a world of difference trying to find a community in, well, one of the largest cities in the United States, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, uh, and my hometown, which has 400 people. Um, I didn't quite fit in here when I was younger, um, and as I've come home, I realize not only does that same issue sort of fall, it's the same sort of issue, but now there's the added um, four year, no, six year difference uh, from me doing work and also university. Uh, so now I've got friends who I knew in high school that have kids and uh, who have kind of gone on with their lives. Um, to kind of put a cork on it, there's just really not a lot of social opportunities in rural America. Um, and for me personally, that's that's my big challenge. Um, I'm not big into hunting, and that's the social thing that everyone does in my area. Um, so because of that, there isn't much going on. Um, it, it's it always makes me mad whenever my friends say there's nothing to do and I say you live in a city there are a million things to do but that's that's where I'll stop. So your story is kind of a mix of stage of life and geography. Um, Keith, you want to join in on this one? Sure. So, uh, so um, I'm a Gen Xer. Um, you know, we're sort of like the generational mutt, if you will. Um, so, you know, being that, you know, being the generation that, uh, um, you know, that that was on the tail end of the civil rights movement, but also, but also a part of the generation that gave rise to the internet. And, you know, when, you, when I think about all the things that happened, um, you know, late 70s, the 80s, God help us, the '90s. Um, um, you know that th there was so much transformation, uh, good and bad, that was that happened um, that that affected um, my ability to um, to not only be communal but also to exist in communities. And so, uh, so for example, I think about I think about uh, my K through twelve schooling, incredibly homogeneous. Um, you know, uh, I, I tell people that uh, that you could take all the black kids in my school and sit us down at one lunch table. Contrast that with when I went to college, I went to an HBCU and for the first time in my life, I felt like I was home. And mm -hmm. so and so now um, and so now um, the community that that I that I most am comfortable with is is similar to my college experience however the community that that i know that i can be most effective in is a more um is a more racially diverse um set of community which i have the hardest time with because mm -hmm. of because of 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 my upbringing being so consumed with dominant culture 
And so, and so that that's a warring um, and conflict even in myself that I still have problems navigating with now. Um, and, and so, um, I'll, I'll kind of leave it. I'll kind of leave it there because it, it gets very loaded and very messy very quickly. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting story. Uh, Jana, you want to jump in on this one too? Sure, Ivan. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you know, COVID turned everybody's life upside down and everything changed. We all kind of went inward. And as being a solo person, I wished I had somebody to shelter with for sure. Would have made um, life more fun. But I took advantage of a lot of the opportunities, online learning, college courses, things like that. And now that I'm in my sixth decade, I enjoy being alone more. I don't have that real desire to go out and be with a lot of people like I used to. When I was in college, I was going to change the world. And now I just, I don't even have that desire. I have small little bits of things that I do with my church and volunteer things because I don't feel like I'm really tired. It just, it's just easier. And I think that's a sad thing to feel because I think a lot of people might be feeling that as well. And um, so anyway, that's that's kind of, if I've, if I've answered your question a little bit about yes, just yeah. my life, how it has changed a lot, but COVID I think really changed it. Right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Molly, you wanna finish it out this yeah. question? I do. Keith, Keith, you, whatever, all, what you said just really resonated with me. I also um, was raised with a lot of uh, diversity in my schooling, although I was deeply connected to a religious community and, and um, was, was, uh, find, I, I did find though in college that I fit in for the first time ever. And it was like a great feeling, but it was because I met a bunch of Jewish hippies and was like, oh, like politically active Jewish hippies. And it became like this very narrow, like subculture. Um, it didn't mean I didn't have diverse friends, but what I found both after college, college less so, but certainly after business school, where I was in a 38% international business school, so very diverse, um, diverse as far as the U.S. as well, that like the, the the friendships were very hard to sustain, even though we'd been so close and been through so much stress and um, doing activities together every night, you know, in business school, like it just, it, it's so easy to become, you um, comfortable with with people who share most of your cultural background um and I think having I, my mom grew up in the black church actually and I think having had like basically the religious upbringing that I did it was very easy for me to kind of like become attached to you know multiple Jewish communities and synagogues and as an adult but then I started realizing like oh my gosh I'm not meeting anyone who's not like me and I actually love being around diverse groups but it's very hard when you're once you reach your 30s and you're entering a new city for the first time it's hard to meet people different from you so I will say as a game designer, I just want to put in one plug. If you do play games at all, actually it's really easy to meet diverse groups because I work with several hundred game stores and they are they do nightly, often free events. And so I do see that as this like interesting third space that is not about alcohol, that's not about religion. And I only got to know that space because I entered the industry. But what I discovered is that a lot of people who are on the spectrum or have social challenges like people who are neurotypical are often very accepted and feel very welcomed in the board game world. And so you end up finding um, that kind of diversity in my industry. Anyway, that's all. All right. Yeah. Ron, did you want to uh, jump in on this last question? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly uh, add to what Keith was saying. Uh, since I'm, I, I'm younger than Keith, you know what I mean? Uh, but uh, he is dead on about, because uh, I had, those type of things too myself as I grew up. But as I went through a threshold of change, I soon realized that uh, that uh, things were were not as as uh, what do you call it, Keith? I mean, things was not as difficult as what the narrative was in my community, and so I start venturing out and. That's where I go back to what Keith was saying in the beginning. I start having more trust because of uh, uh, that's the key to it is, and building relationships. And But I totally agree with him. Well, when I left the community and I went to the school uh, that I went to, I didn't go to a historical black college, but I went up way north of Iowa State. 
Now, can you imagine that, Keith? <laughs> Woo! And I, 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 I'm telling you, and I met some some great people there that uh, were cool. I'll just put it that way. But uh, brother, you'll get there. You'll get there. Just the, your uh, your voice. Just let your voice resonate. And just like John was saying, man, they will be a magnet to you. Then you'll find out, you know, uh, there are people like Braver Angels that will come together and love on you, baby, <laughs> so to speak. All right. All right. Thanks, Ron. Um, you know, I, I got to throw in my two cents. My view of racial identity is completely different. I live in Hawaii. I grew up in Hawaii. Um, I went to undergrad at the State University here. Everybody looks like me. Everybody looks like me in high school. When I got to grad school, I wanted to get away from all of that. So I went to Wisconsin. I was the only Asian in my department. Um, and I, was, I had a great time. The whole purpose was to find people who were not like people from Hawaii. And I did that and I had a great time. And ever since, I don't really resonate with any kind of racial identity type of uh, politics. Um, I'm, I'm a different case. So I'll move on to the next question. Uh, the question is, is regaining social connection solely up to you? So if we find a solution, is it your responsibility? Or if not your responsibility, where should it come from? Who, sh who can solve this problem? Craig, how about you? Well, I, I'm having these thoughts as people are talking and I think what I'm gonna say does relate to your question about is it, is it our individual responsibility to make that change? Or if not, then whose is it? And, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder if, if the two big trend, um, sorry to be professorial about it, but it's, I keep thinking about like, why, 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 right? What are the root causes? And I'm wondering if, um, is I'm done talking? I'm not sure what that was. Strange thing, but um, you know, you're just, less professorial than me. What's that? You're less professorial than me. Okay. It's a strange message. Well, I am a professor, so maybe that's why. <laughs> but I think, like, in addition to the sort of march of technology, which seems to be perhaps part of the reason why human beings are sort of drifting apart, because technology is sort of getting in the way of what was before that just pure human connection. Um, and I mean all technology, not just IT, but everything, right? And transportation technology, communication technology, et cetera. I wonder if the other thing, frankly, is, um, you know, there's been, there's always a lot of discussion in certain circles about, you know, is liberalism failing? You know, and I wonder if that has something to do with it. And the reason I, I think this relates to your question is I wonder if people have come to rely too much on others solving their problems, whether it's government, whether it's technology. And um, I don't know, you'd think that would make them more dependent on others, but it seems to be having the opposite. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Shannon, you haven't um, joined us yet. How about you coming in now? Yeah, I just, that question, um, I think invitation has a really powerful impact on getting people to join you. I think um, my example of that is when I sent my first daughter off to kindergarten and a lady that knew me just through a church um, setting happened to be in the same classroom and said, hey, you should be the room mom for your kid's class. And I I don't think I'd ever really volunteered for anything <laughs> before then, you know, and, um, and that kind of set me off on lots of volunteering 
So, um, so just that little invitation, I think, was really powerful. And then I think that's true in a in a faith situation too. The power of invitation is is very um, very meaningful. So, yeah, it's not just on us; it's on us to invite others to join us, or be in a position where you can get a invitation. Right. Um, mm -hmm. On. I, I agree with Shannon, and, and I agree with what everybody said. You know, Keith and Ivan and, and Ron, you make really good points. I think it's important to the the title of of the of the current Putnam theme is "Join or Die," right? So I think it's important that it is on us to get out there and join. You know, the the quote is attributed to Woody Allen when they gave him an award, and he said, "Well, eighty percent of my success in life has been showing up." And I think that's part of it too. But as, as Shannon was just saying, it's important to invite people. And so I, I think that's the conundrum that I, I mentioned earlier that uh, people find themselves in, uh, you know, where, where clubs find themselves in where they say, oh, our membership is declining. Well, are you recruiting enough? And are you being uh, inclusive and inviting to people? Or do when people show up, they say, Oh, I can see who the SFGs are here that run everything, and, and I'm never going to be one of them. So I might as well, you know, here's this is my sole visit to this club. And I think that's that's something to be aware of that uh, really degrades joining. But you really do have to get out there and, and seek out those diverse opportunities. I think that's one of the things that, uh, to Philip's point about uh, his generation, that uh, that generation needs to maybe needs to be bolder uh, about that. I, as I said, I revere the, the greatest generation because they were all thrown into World War II together, and and they had a cause. You know, beat uh, authoritarian powers from across the sea and win World War II, and they learned how to get. They were exposed to other people, and they learned how to get along. And I think that was part of the of the great. Uh, American building of, of Western society in the 50s and the 60s, although it, it did have a lot of warts that really, uh, again, made the, the, the situation that we're in now. But And, and the, the fraying is, I think, is, as Shannon is saying, it's both. We, 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 all, we, we have to get out there ourselves, but we also have to invite others uh, to join us and be inclusive. All right. And uh, Keith, how about closing us out on this? So I, I, I don't disagree, but I'm going to offer a different perspective. Um, so one of the organizations that I'm a part of, uh, Be The Bridge, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the things that I do with them is, is specifically focus on, on believers of color who have, who have decided that they're very inviting and seemingly welcoming multicultural church is is anything but that. And pretty much as they are heading out of the door, they're sort of like uh, they're sort of like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, right? But there's a beauty of there's a beauty to that, and and I and I don't want to. Uh, again, I, I, I'm, I, I want to agree and affirm everything that everyone else has said, but there is a beauty in finding community in a surjoin. When when you're out there, when you when you come to a place where where you sort of come to yourself and say, you know what, what people are telling me is normative, is not normal for me, and I can't be here and I decide to leave, there are other people out there in the wilderness. And eventually you find people in the wilderness. And that becomes a whole new, a whole new vibrant and fresh way uh, and environment for people to connect and find community. So, so there's nothing wrong with being inviting, but it's not the only way because there are people in the wilderness who are, who are connecting who have never been invited to the wilderness. They just went. Yeah, I know about that. <laughs> I've been in the wilderness quite a while myself. 
Um, and I'll turn it over now to Molly. Cool. Well, this uh, leads perfectly and unintentionally into our next question. So one of the things I, I always like to come back to with our films is what did they miss? What what was um, obvious to you that was clearly not obvious to the filmmaker or the people the film is about? So I want to look at solutions that didn't come up. So for example, uh, specifically, I mean, uh, do you know a way to gain? Are you familiar with ways to gain social connection that has been overlooked? Another way to say it is, what do you think was missing from the conversation about how to solve these, you know, central society-wide problems in the film? Um, we've already talked about some solutions that were not touched on. I don't feel like there was a lot, for example, in the movie on inviting people in. Um, and while you're getting ready to come up with your answers to this question, I'll share one practice I've really, I've seen work really well in terms of um, religious communities trying to be more inclusive is to... Um, is to look around for new people. There's something we used to do in a, a minion, like a community I used to organize in Brooklyn. We would look around for whoever was new and make sure they got a personal outreach later and make sure that they didn't just get like a, hello, where are you from? Like, you know, beyond the surface level, small talk that most people hate anyway. Um, and so flagging new people. Another thing I noticed from years ago in my Hillel, like a Jewish community on campus was someone from the community invited me over to his family and then like asked my name afterwards. Like, and so I decided it was like, oh, you don't even know my name to trust me to invite me into your home. And I started doing that too, where I like just like invite people to do things without like, it doesn't matter if I know you yet, you know, there's, there's trust already in the community. And so that's one example, just that we talked about inviting people in. So um, I want to just hear solutions that were not in the film specifically. We all, and when I say not in the film, I mean, the film focused heavily on joining things, join stuff, join stuff. That's what the village, whatever it was, the village thing did too. Um, and then so, to some extent, like start a thing, start a new thing, you know, but there was a lot missing to me in the film as to other solutions. So yeah, take a moment. Because obviously it is a problem if, if, you know, Italian democracy failed when we didn't bowl together or whatever. So, which is a little bit of a dramatic way of saying the thesis. Um, yeah, don't see a huge rise in hand, so we'll, I'll give it once, going twice. I'll say one thing they tried that failed that I think could have been done better, that was the Saguaro seminar. That was a seminar people from all over different professions who tried to come together and solve this on a society-wide scale, and he said it was basically a failure. Uh, yeah, go for it, Jenna. So, I, I, I saw the movie just a week ago, and I can't remember everything, but... I, I'm just thinking of people who are in some of these long-standing institutions being able to address the needs of the people that they would like to to become a member or join or whatever, you know, and be willing to make some changes because a lot of people are not willing to make changes with whatever they have going on whether it's just even the type of worship, the format of worship or whatever, you know. Um, I guess it's just one thing I'm thinking of is just to really evaluate what what you're, you have to offer for the people you would like to join you. So. That's great. Figure out needs by asking, not assuming them. Yeah. Um, very community organizing perspective. Go for it, Donna. Yeah, I was going to ask a question about this later, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll bring it up now because it does, uh, it is a potential solution, um, which is that year of service uh, that has been proposed uh, after high school, um, having students um, do some type of public service, whether it's military service or teaching um, or what have you, but getting people out of the community they've always lived with and going someplace else to interact with people who are quite different than them. And uh, now that would involve probably the government in that particular case, but it'd be a way to get people connecting to each other um, in a way that they are not connecting now with different types of people. Thank you for that. Philip and then John, and then I think we'll switch questions since we're almost at the end here. Go, Philip. Uh, go for it whenever you're ready. Uh, Donna, what if I I told you that program exists and is actively running? 
It is a it is a federally run program that I was a manager for last year called AmeriCorps and Triple C. Um, I have put a link into the chat. Um, in fact, Joe Biden has actually expanded AmeriCorps to include a climate core for next year where members will learn how to build um, renewable energy, how to develop um other programs. And yet, yeah, I'm seeing in the chat that it needs to be mandatory. I, I think that if AmeriCorps, the basis of it were expanded um, and maybe, I don't know, mandatory scares me, but maybe tie it to a uh, free or subsidized education. That's something that me and a lot of other people in my uh, program talked about. If they paid for your schooling when you went to AmeriCorps, um, I think that'd be one heck of a program. So Thanks. Uh, John, go for it. Wrap, wrap us up on yeah, this I question. I was just going to agree. With, I was just going to second Donna's motion. I'm, I'm a believer in national service, too. Uh, I keep referring to the greatest generation. I, you know, when there was a draft, uh, you, you did uh, bring people together in a way that taught them in the military. And I think having that kind of community, you don't have to be in the military for national service. It, you can choose from AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, whatever climate core whatever uh, you you wanted to choose but i think that that uh kennedy asked ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country uh, uh early in in your life i think would would be good and uh, from a military point of view i think it would be good because you could downsize the the, the standing active duty military and have a larger reserve where if people went to military training then maybe they could come back for four years or eight years when they're in their 30s, you know, after they'd had some life skills. And I think that would be good overall, not only for the military, but for society at large to have that national service and, and have it be mandatory. Yeah, I will say, like, I think it's just, even if like individuals have benefited, I think society overall has actually suffered for lack of the military draft. Um, and I don't want to get into to why I think people like see like, a lot of people get out of the draft or like who you see out of the draft now, like, like entire classes are not included in the draft, right? Um, entire social classes will never have to go to the army because they don't, there's no economic need and, you know, et, et cetera. But um, Donna, why don't you do the next one of your two questions that's coming up, whichever one you prefer, I guess. Okay. Um, then. Um, so. This question, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but it's, uh, the question is, what has changed in terms of club membership since your parents and grandparents joined clubs versus when you think about the kind of clubs, organizations, or religious communities you've joined today that give you a sense of connection? And I will um, provide an example. Um, my parents, my mom's still alive at 94. If my dad were alive, he'd be at 100. So members of the silent generation, um, they... And, came to, neither of them were from Rochester, New York. They moved there. They uh, wanted to meet more people. And so uh, there was a, a club they joined at the YMCA. Uh, and it was a club where single people got together, did outings, et cetera. And wouldn't you know, those single people uh, fell in love with each other, uh, as my parents did. And they went ahead uh, and then joined a couple, they, they founded a couples club. So the people who had gotten together from that club and maybe brought in some others uh, were part of this couples club that would get together for picnics. And as they had children, they would get the kids together too. They formed a card club um, as a, a subset of the couples club. Uh, so that's how they uh, met each other. Now I'm gonna contrast this with what Molly said uh, in the chat that her cousins met um, by gaming together. Uh, and uh, that was the way that they met each other. Uh, and Molly, I'm assuming they gamed online and then somehow got to meet each other in person after that. So there's a, a difference in how things have um, been between generations. Any other uh, examples about how things have changed in terms of generations uh, and what kinds of clubs that you that now you find sustenance from and connection? Going once, going twice. 
I'll just say briefly that some a few things I noticed changed. One is it feels like Rotary and Lions, like these clubs, like feel a little bit old school to me as a millennial. I don't know why um, exactly, but uh, and maybe they're just like not suburban things. And I grew up in a suburb of St. Louis. I'm not sure, but they that's one thing that it maybe is like hurting membership of younger people. I don't know. And another thing is um, like my grandma, I mean, granted, she she passed away when she was a little younger than me. She was 38, but she did women's auxiliary things um, like women, the ladies supporting the soldiers like today, like women are soldiers. Right. So like to so some extent, I see some of the things that my grandma's did as out not like not necessary anymore. If that's one way to put it. Um, I just don't see the same need for like, I mean, I'm not saying there's no, it should never be a women's group ever. I just mean like, I don't see the same need for women's versions of things, for example. So maybe that's why a shift has happened as well. Yeah. Um, I just recently toured the Masonic Memorial in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and the fellow who gave us the tour um, talked about how he had moved to Virginia from the Midwest, didn't know anybody, and the way he met people was by joining the Freemasons. Uh, so that was a great way to to get to know others. Of course, other men. Uh, there are there there are female Freemason organizations, but they're not uh, they're not acknowledged by the the large Freemason organization. Uh, but it, but. Freemasons too is a uh, a moral organization. It, it it inculcates moral behavior uh, on the part of others. Uh, a lot of our presidents are Freemasons. The most recent one being Gerald Ford. Uh, so it's kind of an old organization, old fashioned, uh, but it it served a purpose and it still continues to to some extent. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn this over now to Ivan, who's going to introduce our next movie that we'll be discussing next month. Ivan? Um, unmute yourself, Ivan. After all this time, I still forget. Um, giving you a heads up on the next film for November 14, that's the tentative date, the film is a documentary called The Greater Idaho Movement, Why Some Want to Leave Oregon. And it's about the current effort, and it's really happening. Counties in Eastern Oregon are voting to secede from the rest of Oregon. Um, it's an interesting topic. I think the topic is much more than Oregon. It's about a rural and urban divide it's about populations that consistently lose at the polls. What do you do? So stay tuned for that one. And it's very easy to see, it's on YouTube. We'll put the information out on our film club page. Okay, thank you, Ivan. And, and lastly, uh, and it's, that's probably gonna be October 4th, uh, November 14th, um, and uh, it'll be on our film club page. We'll also advertise it in the newsletter. Uh, uh, just to verify the date. And then lastly, Ron, would you take us home by telling people why they should join Greater Angels? I don't know if I'm gonna tell them. I'll just, I'll just give them my appetite. How about <laughs> that? Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, the conversation tonight uh, re really resonated with me in my mind, not so much in my ears. And I tend to like the think as I'm listening to people. And I hope it was very insightful for all of you. And, I, and man, it was so, many, so much uh, profound uh, perspective tonight uh, about the groups and a lot of different things. And so uh, just like Donna said, uh, I know some of you are part of Brave Angels and then some of you are new. And that's what we do. We try to bring all perspectives together. Uh, can we bridge the divide in one session? No. It takes time. Just like I spoke to Keith and I said, man, Keith, everything that you went through, I went through already and probably double. And now I'm at a point in my life where it's like all gravy. And I really enjoy dialogue, civil dialogue. And if you are like me, you need to join Braver Angels. 
go to our website at uh, braverangels.org. It's only a dollar a month. What is that, $12? My father used to say two bits, you know, join this group for two bits. <laughs> Any of you know what that means? But anyway, um, we at Brave Angels like to give everybody their perspective. We don't want to change you. We don't want to uh, mold you into what's out there. We just want civil conversation and maybe we can come to some type of uh, uh, togetherness. Uh, but the main thing is, is trying to heal this country. And, and as you all know, it's going to take a long time. But from my nickname, which is Sugar Bear, I really enjoyed tonight. And I hope you did too. And I hope you come back. And if not with Film Club, well, we have many different networks that you can join. Just go to our website, check it out. And then uh, you might see my smiley face again. With that, have you have a nice evening. Thank you very much.